Hi, this is Rabbi Chaim Kaufman. Welcome to our 167th installment in the Torah portion of the week. We are holding by <coughs> Parashas Truma. Parashas Truma speaks about the Mishkan. Speaks about placing God in a box, so to speak. Exactly how we do that. That's Kabbalah 101, or maybe 101A. But making the making of the tabernacle and all the dimensions. Right, you get the ark, the cover, the table, menorah. Uh, the covers of the tabernacle, the walls, all these things, right? We get lost, right? We almost get lost in the, you know, in all the directions and all the building, you know, and all that. We forget about, you know, exactly what the purpose, you know, of the Mishkan is. So Torah says, chapter 26, verse verse 15. Right? Again, chapter 26, verse 15, book of Exodus. Torah tells us, you shall make the planks. Of the tabernacle of acacia wood, standing erect. Right, so Torah's talking about dimensions, right? Of 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 taking these planks, you know, standing them erect, etc. Comes along Rashi. Rashi explains that these these planks are specifically used, you know, this piece of wood specifically for this. Now, this is where they come from. So Yaakov Avinu planted these cedar trees in Egypt. And when he died, he commanded his sons to take the take this wood, right? Take this take this wood when he come out of Egypt. Why? Because he said in the future, God is going to command you to make a Mishkan, to make a tabernacle in the midbar in the desert. And you're gonna need acacia wood. You're gonna need Atse Shiti. Right? This acacia wood. So therefore, what did he do? He prepared it. Right? He took it out of Egypt. Brought it with him. Sorry, he brought it. He brought it to Egypt. And he commanded his sons to take it out afterwards. Come on, the Medrash. And the Medrash says that Avram Avinu planted it in Beersheba. Right? He, he had a he had a he planted this there. And Yaakov went there, traveled there uprooted it in order to bring it to him bring it with him to Egypt because he knew the Jews were going to need the wood in the future for the building of the Mishkan so Avram planted it first Yaakov went to take it brought it brought it to Egypt and then commanded his sons to take it out take it out of Egypt for the sake of building building the Mishkan says Mori Verebi Arav Agon or Moshtar Moshlita should be well. Brings down in Hochma Vadas. He says, This is a power. This is an unbelievable thing. It's a wonder. He says, The Abbas Akadoikshim, our holy forefathers, didn't want the nations, the non Jewish nations, whatsoever, to have any anything to do with this. Right? In other words, the Mishkan itself. Only going to be built by Jews. Non-Jews, no connection. Now, if Moshe Rabbeinu had taken, taken the wood, taken the cedar wood from Egypt, then what would have happened? You would have given the non-Jews the merit. Right? Why? Because they planted it there. Right? So if the non-Jews planted it there, you're, you're giving them benefit. Right? You're giving them merit. Because they planted it, and now the fact that they planted it, we're using their wood. Taking it out of Egypt. Going to use it for the holy task of building the Mishka. So therefore, since they don't want to give any merit to the non-Jews, this is something that's going to be totally holy. We're going to, we're going to speak about this um, soon. But the idea is, Yaakov wanted to plant it, right? wanted to use it. It was planted by Avram. Yaakov took it, brought it to Mitzrayim, brought it to Egypt, and he wants, and he tells his sons when he dies, take it out. No non Jews going to have any, any part of it. So they need to give them any merit. This is something that is pure, purely holy. The one a non Jew contaminating it. Spiritual cooties, in my language. So they don't want them having any part of it. And therefore, when you're going to put in, the holy things, the ark, you know, the wood, all these, all these materials, 
and they're being used to build, be, to build a holy thing. So you want holy people doing it. You don't want unholy people having any connection. Right, so to the Grah of Elijah Vilna the Vilna Gon. Vilna Gon brings down from the Gemara Bab Metziah 85b. The Rabbi Yechia himself planted flax. Right, he took from it and he made nets and he trapped a deer and from the, and from all these other things. Right, he made he, he made a Torah in order for the children to learn. And he says it's a wonder. Right, my Rebbe points out the wonder. Rebbe Chia wanted to teach Torah to kids. Right, to make sure Torah's not going to be lost. So he himself is going to teach them Torah. Right, because they didn't have, any, they didn't have anyone to teach him. So, so he said, what's well, going to be with the next generation? I'll teach them. Right, I'll teach them. But he's such a holy person. Why in the world... You know, did he waste his time? His precious time could have been learning. Could have been teaching others. What did he do? He trapped a deer for the sake of the skin. So he could write the Chum Torah. The Chamisha Chum Torah. He could write the five books of Moses. Write it on this on this skin. He did it all himself. He could have got other people to do it. He himself was a great rabbinic scholar. Right? So, my Rebbe says, wonder. Why in the world should he do it? Let someone else do it. Right, he'll teach them. But let someone else do all the dirty work. Why does he have to do the dirty work? Therefore, he says, he wanted to do everything himself for the sake of holiness. That every aspect of it, every aspect and every step is going to be holy. <clears throat> and he's going to do it <clears throat> for a holy purpose. So he doesn't want anyone else doing it because he's going to put all his strength, all his spiritual strength, is going to go into doing all this. And if someone else does it, then they enter, their, then their thoughts enter these actions. And who knows where their thoughts are? Maybe their thoughts are not, you know, fully on the holiness aspect. Maybe they're, you know, maybe the thoughts are elsewhere when they're doing this. And intention is everything. But on, on that, that's not enough. Because my Rebbe asks, I, but the building of the base on Mikdash, what about the Holy Temple? It was done by thousands of non-Jews in the times of King Solomon. As it's brought down in Sefer Malachim. Right in the Book of Kings. Now, if you're talking about building based on Mikdash, King Solomon, the wisest of all men, why do you use Goyim? Why do you use non-Jews over here? Why was he worried, like the Gemara says by Rabbi Yeshia? Why did he do everything himself? Or at least get Jews to do it at the right intention. So he says it could be that by the Mishkan, by the tabernacle itself, the holiness was unbelievable. Right, the holiness was very, very strong. And the tabernacle itself is going to be forever. Right, even if we're not going to use it, we have the base of Mikdash. It's going to be forever. So therefore, the holiness has to be top level. Right, it has to be the highest level. Therefore, he's very careful to do everything himself. Um... Or, in this case, King Solomon allowed non-Jews to do it because he knew in the end it's going to get destroyed. So that's why I wasn't worried about putting all the, you know, putting all extra holiness into it. Because he knew in the end it's going to get destroyed. Also, also the arrow, the Holy Ark, also is going to stand forever. It got buried. Right, he got buried, so therefore it needed also extra holiness to be used. So therefore, we weren't going to have just, you know, a normal artisan or craftsman do it. You needed someone at Yerushalayim, right, someone at Fear of Heaven, someone who's a massive Talmud Chacham, a rabbinic scholar. So, 
So Rebbe then tells the following story. He says, he says that Moshe Schneider, a Rab Moshe Schneider, Zechot Tzadik Tevrocho, his Rebbe, famous student of Chofetz Chaim, was very careful never to accept any money for the sake of Torah, for the sake of his yeshiva, from Machawi Shabbos. People desecrated Shabbos. And even though, even though the yeshiva suffered, they suffered a lot. They had trouble raising money. Well, they're worth it. You know, you give them a merit. You give them a merit. It'll help them spiritually. So why not? You know, even if it's temporary. Right? But he said, no. Even if it's going to be good for now, in the future it's going to be bad. Because the influence that they have by giving the money is going into the walls of the yeshiva. And if these people don't keep Shabbos, so that influence goes into the walls. And the end result could be, the end result could be that the education of the students of the Bacharim there it's going to be lacking. It's going to be lacking in the holiness. And then what's going to happen? Then it could snowball. And, you, and in the end, you might not have yeshiva at all. Because even though they could have had people that didn't keep Shabbos helping and ready to help, he refused. Not only that, not only that, you know, it's hardly any food talking during World War II. So, they got bread, leftover bread from, from a bakery that wasn't Machal Shabbos, that didn't desecrate Shabbos. To that extent, right, to that extent, that's what they were willing to do. That's the holiness that is the holiness of the yeshiva of Moshe Schneider. And through that, through that holiness, what do you have? You have G'dayi You have unbelievable rabbinic scholars, my rabbi included, that came out of that yeshiva. So, th there's, a, there's, a, there's an idea over here that something that's built for the sake of holiness, right? You're talking a yeshiva. You're talking, well, in this case, talking the Mishkat. Talking the Beis HaMikdash. Right? The Beis HaMikdash is going to be different because in the end it's going to be destroyed. Or in the end it's going to be destroyed, I can have non-Jews. I can have non-Jews participate and help. In this case, whether it's a synagogue well, let, let, let's talk about the Mishkan, right? Something that its holiness is going to be forever. You cannot compromise. There is no possible way to compromise by taking money from people who don't keep Shabbos. Because that's going to have a negative effect in the walls. And that's going to have a negative effect on the students and the people learning there. So comes along with Moshe Schneider and he says, you know, I can be really helped out by these people who don't keep Shabbos. They talk and have money. They're going to help, you know, save me in this terrible situation. But I'm not going to take their money. Because their money comes from, because their money comes from being Mechal Shabbos. And if it comes from desecrating Shabbos, there's no blessing in it. Just the opposite. It's going to have a totally negative effect. Now, there is a discussion. There is a discussion whether a person, in general, should they take money from someone who desecrates Shabbos? Right? Or someone who's not religious. Right? So I say they're not religious, they probably don't keep Shabbos. Okay! Right? But someone who's not religious, I don't have to take money from them. So it depends. If they want to give money to a shul, to a synagogue, right? An Orthodox synagogue, to a yeshiva or something, don't use it for anything holy. Right, you could use it 
you know, for supplies in the bathroom. Can use it, I don't know, pay someone who's cleaning the floors. Whatever the case is. But you don't use it for something holy. Because intention, when it comes to something holy, is everything. The person may poo-poo that and they say, oh, what kind of intention? Right, how could this have a negative effect on the students? And then they do with them. Not like they meet the donor. I mean, maybe they will, but in general, not like they meet the donor. So if they don't meet the donor, not going to have an influence. Not going to have an influence, big deal. So let them support it. But the fact that he doesn't keep Shabbos, and he desecrates it, and he gets money from that, should not be used for something holy. All right, that that was that was what Ramosha Schneider held, and there are others, you know, other great rabbis who you know hold the same thing. Now, on the flip side, flip side, someone who wants to give charity, but there are non non-religious Jew wants to give charity, doesn't keep Shabbos. So either you'll take the money, but you won't use it for anything holy, or you'll say, you know what? Why shouldn't we take money? Because it doesn't keep Shabbos. Teach him to give charity. Give charity to a good cause. Right? It'll keep the yeshiva going. It'll keep the shul going. Keep these other things going. So it's a merit for them. It's a tremendous merit. And as Mishra Pirkei Avo says, Mitzvah Gorera is Mitzvah. Avera Gorera is Avera. Person does a Mitzvah. You know, awakens a spark in his soul. You want to do other mitzvahs. You transgress, you want to do other transgressions, right? It goes both ways. That being the case, they'll say, okay, let's look at the first part. <laughs> we'll be positive. You do, you do mitzvahs. You'll be inspired to do other mitzvahs. Maybe eventually, you'll stop being Mechal Shabbos. Right? You'll stop not keeping Shabbos. You know, you start to keep Shabbos. You know, slowly but surely. Until you keep Shabbos altogether. Now, is that definitely going to happen? I'm not saying it's going to definitely happen. Right? But in the end, it awakens the spark. Even though it might take a 9 volt, you know, you think, you know, this person's got the, the status of a 9 volt and he's going to try and start a Jeep with it or a Humvee. Forget it. Never going to happen. But you can take that 9 volt and you can give it juice. And you give it more juice. And you give it more juice. Right? Till eventually, the person overcomes that. Now, it's certainly not going to be easy. Right? But, it, you know, that's the, other, that's the other side of the argument. That a person's giving them a merit. Right? You're giving them a merit. And through that merit, they are going to, you know, it's going to affect their soul. It's going to affect their soul in a positive way. Now, let's look at the negativity, right? Sometimes we focus a little bit on the negative. And the negativity here is, Ramosha Schneider said, that the money's going to go into the walls. If it goes into the walls, it has a negative effect. The intention, the fact that they don't keep Shabbos, has an effect on the walls. You know, our intentions have an effect on what we do. So we give the famous example, Famous example by, by Elisha Ben Abuya. Elisha Ben Abuya, otherwise known as Acher, the other one, that he was on the Sanhedrin and he got booted off, became a heretic. So what happened? He started looking at all the philosophies of the world and eventually went sour. But where did it start? How did this happen? So, it happened by his bris. By a circumcision. Well, what happened by a circumcision? Right? So, the brought down as Talmud tells us that one of the great rabbis came came to the circumcision. His father was a very prominent person. Right? He's close to the government. A very prominent person. The rabbis came to learn and a pillar of fire came down and surrounded them. So, Elijah ben Abuya's father asked them, what are you doing? Coming here to burn down my house? Going to burn down this whole area? 
They said, no, this, this is the power of Torah, right? This is a, you know, a heavenly fire protecting us, you know, while we learn. So his father was so taken aback. I right? said, wow, this is unbelievable. You know, that's the power of Torah. That's what I want for my son. Right? I want that for my son. So Elijah ben Abuya had his bris, had his circumcision. Who was the sandik? Who was the one who held the baby? Right, it's a very big honor to hold the baby. It was none other than his father. Right now, you have to understand, when the baby's placed on the sandik, whoever it is, it's like putting it on an altar. Now, when he put it on the altar, i.e. his father, his father was and had negative intention here. He wanted the Torah to be used for power, fame. Not for what it should have been used for. So because of that negative intention, and that went into his son, his son became a true scholar, no question about it. But he went sour. The rabbis tell us, why did he go sour? Because the base of when he started in this world was sour. His father was sour. That is why a non-religious Jew, doesn't matter, they can yell and scream and jump up and down. You do not allow them to hold the baby in a circumcision. Right? You got to give it to a rabbinic scholar. At least someone who shows her Shabbos. Someone who keeps Shabbos. But, you know, if the grandfather, great-grandfather doesn't keep Shabbos, you don't give them that honor. You give them other honors. But you cannot give them that honor. Because you're putting the child, you're putting the child on a, you know, on an altar that's disgusting in God's eyes. So even if it doesn't manifest itself at the beginning, it's going to come out at some point. It's got that negative influence. You want to call it spiritual cooties, whatever it is. But you don't allow a non-religious person to be that. You do other things at the circumcision. That he can't do. He cannot be like an altar. He's not an altar. He doesn't represent Torah. He spits in God's face. He doesn't do what he's supposed to do. Yeah, there may be arguments. They may stand on principle. And they say, I deserve this honor. Maybe you do. Right? And therefore, if that was the case, you know, if that was the case, even if you do deserve the honor, it's not a personal vendetta here. If they kept Shabbos, and they kept other mitzvahs, okay? They deserve the honor. If they don't keep Shabbos, they got the status of a non-Jew. For many things. Now, no offense to any non-Jews out there. Right? But at the end of the day, you don't want a non-Jew holding your baby at a circumcision. You can't, they're not an altar. No matter if they're a Noahide or not. Right? You want someone who keeps Shabbos, a Jew. So they have to have proper intention. You know, it's not a Kabbalistic intention. So a person who holds the baby has the merit to hold the baby at a bris. At a circumcision, what are you thinking? The main thing you're thinking is, I want this kid to be a Talmud Chochum. I want him to be a rabbinic scholar. Right? Forget lawyer, doctor, anything else. You want him to be a rabbinic scholar. Right? That's, you want him to be the cream of the crop. Okay, if he doesn't merit that, he doesn't merit that. But that's what we pray for. Right? And she married someone who's the daughter of a Talmud Chochum. Of a rabbinic scholar. You want the best. You want to say, wow, that would be my 10th choice. Right? Really, I have intention. He should be a lawyer. <laughs> he should be a doctor. He should be a tax collector. Impressive things. Right? We're not asking for that. We're asking he become a rabbinic scholar. That's the most important thing more than anything else. Is Torah scholarship. Right? Which differentiates us from any other group. Even the modern Orthodox. Because according to them, okay. 
It's good to be a rabbinic scholar, but I can also be a rabbi doctor, a doctor rabbi. Not a contradiction. Get the best of both worlds. That's why the majority of rabbinic scholars coming out today are from my camp. The outer orthodox camp, not the other camp. That's just the reality. Right, well, so what's the reason? Main reason is because Torah scholarship is everything. That's what we're striving for. So, so there are certain things that have to start out on a tremendously high spiritual level. It's not something you want to mess around with. Ah, you tell me spiritual cooties, this, that, you don't see, you don't feel it. Kids aren't going to, you know, the, the father, grandfather, whoever, is just holding the baby. What in the world's the big deal? What, what can they do? What they can do is have a negative spiritual influence. And when you have a negative spiritual influence, it'll come out eventually. Now, even if you have the greatest rabbinical authority there, and he's the one holding the baby. Now, is that a guarantee? That child's going to be a rabbinic scholar? No. Certainly doesn't help. Got a fighting chance. You got a better than fighting chance. No guarantee. But if you have someone who's not holding anywhere, and you have them keep Shabbos to boot, you ain't using them. Because you don't want that, you don't want that negative energy going into the child. Whether you fathom it, whether you don't fathom it, that's what's going on. Right? And the Talmud bears this out. So, you know, when you look at something like that, you know, at that level. So when it comes to a yeshiva, when it comes to a kol, right, a place for married men to learn after marriage, they, you know, they want to learn at a high level. You want to sustain it the best way you can, but you want to uphold the holiness of the place. Upholding the holiness of the place means you take money from people fitting to give. Someone doesn't keep shops, you want their money. You don't want their info. They may be nice people. Not saying not. But in the end, what does King David say? Those that hate God, I hate. Those who love him, I love. That means that the enemies of God are my enemies. They could be nice people. So what? Are they nice to God? They keep what God wants? No. So therefore, you're not going to use them for these things. So if a person's ever in that situation, you have to make clear, this is not a personal thing. Right? Someone who doesn't keep shop is the status of a non-Jew. That's the reality. Nothing personal. You have a status. You may say, well, I don't believe it like you. And it's not really what it is. And this doesn't matter. We uphold the Torah. We uphold the truth. We are not going to compromise. So the truth is, that's your status. Am I, you know, am I calling you names? Am I saying I don't want to give you the honor? I'm not saying that. I'd love to give you the honor. But what's the problem? I can't. It's a spiritual thing. It's not, not a personal thing. Now people get offended. You know, they don't hold by it. They, this, you know, they favor a rabbi over, over me and this and that. It's an Owen situation. Right? You're not going to win the argument. The only thing you can do is damage control. And this is what you say. You know, you try and make it as much as possible, you know, that it's not a, sli a personal slight. But they may not hear it. They may not hear it. And they might get offended, okay? But at the end of the day, you want to give your kid the best chance. Right? For spiritual survival. Spiritual greatness. 
You are not going to take a chance. Right, that, that's the question by Moshe Rabbeinu, that, he, that Yisrael wanted one of his kids uh, to be an idol worshiper. So we see that eventually that happened. They say, how can you make a condition? They really want him, that Yisrael really want him to study, you know, idolatry, etc. No, no, obviously he came to the truth. Right, As the commentaries explain that it means that he should learn up on it. You know, know how to answer what idolatry is, but not actually going to practice idolatry. I thought we're not going to make a condition like that. So, you know, I'll help you. I'll do this. I'll do that. But I want, you know, I want your kid to do this, which is negative. Why would I do that? Why in the world would I do that? You're not giving him the best chance to survive. Spiritually. Had a number of people say over the years, well, we'll see what happens to your kids. We'll see how they end up. So they all end up doing the right thing. You guys I got lucky? Yeah, I could say that. But they also had a better education. You try and give them the best education. That suits them. It's going to make them spiritually succeed. If you give them a half-baked education, Jewish education, you don't keep anything yourself. You give it all lip service. How in the world is the kid going to turn out all right? Spiritually. Now, if I do that, is there a guarantee they're going to come out the right way? No. Because you see, there's a dropout rate. Let's say it's a 10% dropout rate. I don't know exactly what the stats are. Let's say it's 10%. But that means 90% of the time we're winning. So we don't we want to have a 0% dropout rate. That was the reality. But you have to give them the best shot. People say, yeah, let them see the real world. Let them see this. Let them experience that. You're not giving them the best shot. You know, you send them to Hebrew school twice a week. You know, once a week, whatever. But you don't believe in anything. You just keep the holidays at a minimal. Whatever the case is. Your kid doesn't have a fighting chance. It's finished. You know, we know enough what's bad out there. Certainly in spiritual terms, why would I have to expose my kid to that? Right? People say, yeah, Central University, you know, let him have a more open-minded education till the brains fall on the floor. And it's a great idea. You know, someone once told me, I said, I got I a better idea. I said, I'm willing, not true, but I'm willing to send my kids to university. You send your boys to yeshiva. You send your two boys to have a proper Jewish education. Oh, no, I would never do that. Because you're not that open-minded, are you? You say, it's a cult. They're brainwashed. And you use every, you know, every excuse in the book. But obviously, you're not that open-minded because your kids will never learn that. They'll get a half-baked education. You see, my kids study. This is what happened. Got to give them a fighting chance. Right, there are two Rashi's. Rashi in one place says that the Levim, that the, the Levites served, started serving in the temple when they were 25. In another place it says they were 30. Discrepancy, right? Sorry. The Rashi doesn't say it, the Torah says that. So the discrepancy, five years, what's, what's the difference? So Rashi says you got to give somebody five years uninterrupted learning, see if they have the potential to be something. If you see that they don't, you know, the, the learning's not really going, okay, they'll do other things. But you have to give them the potential. You have to see what they can do. You don't just cut off their learning straight away. Oh, but it's been learning for so long. Yeah, the mind's just starting to develop. You know, just starting to understand. To make heads and tails of things. You gotta give an opportunity. If you see within those five years that doesn't go, the Rashi says it'll never go. Right? But you have to give him a certain amount of time. You know, so in the you know, in the quote unquote, let's say, non-Orthodox world, 
I said, what do you mean? He's already 18. Look how much he learned already. Look at all his yeshiva studies. Want to do something real, like go to college. We may have, a, you know, an unbelievable grueling schedule. You know, two mornings in, two afternoons a week. Go figure. But you didn't give him a real opportunity. So, there's a negative influence here. And it doesn't matter whether we see it, whether we fathom it, or anything else. It's seeping in the walls. When it seeps in the walls, it can have a negative effect. To the extent, says Ramosha Schneider, I would rather take day-old bread. Day-old bread. And they were starving. They have food. He said, I'd still rather take day-old bread from, from a bakery that keeps Shabbos than take fresh bread from a bakery that doesn't. Because the nourishment that these boys get is going to have an effect on the entire place. And when then that happens, he says, I'm not taking any chances. So therefore, he didn't take money from people that didn't keep Shabbos. So now, what was the end result? Was his yeshiva um, successful? Unbelievably successful. He produced Torah giants. According to everybody. That was a secret. Not that he himself wasn't a Torah giant. He was. And a. You know. Educator par excellence. Certainly was. But he said that was a Hatzloch. That was the success of the yeshiva. That everything that was used in building it. Was for the sake of heaven. And it wasn't being, you know, nothing was given by anyone whose thoughts went against Torah. Or didn't keep Torah properly. That's the holiness that, that kept it alive. And that kept it strong. Now, in the big eight are here. The very, very big evil inclination. And the reason is very simple. Because what do you have over here? This is during World War II. England's getting bombed like no tomorrow. S food is scarce. There are times there's very little food at all. And they could have been, you know, they could have been helped tremendously. And Ramosha Schneider stood, stood firm. His students stood firm. And because they did that unbelievable self-sacrifice, and the holiness that went in and keeping it together, that was it. That was a success. So, if you want to tell me, as my Rebbe says, then if in the end something's going to get destroyed, I don't need the holiness. But I know in the end it's going to get destroyed. So I see by the base of Mikdash, by the temple, King Solomon uses non-Jews to build it. No problem. In the end, it's going to get destroyed. But something that's going to last forever, even if it's buried right now, but it's forever, you need holiness. You need only holiness. And that's, that is the major difference. So I want to remind everyone, I have a class every Sunday, 9 o'clock in the morning, New York time, five o'clock, 4 o'clock Israel time, Book of Leviticus, we're now starting new Parsha. Parsha tells me all about leprosy or whatever it is, whatever Saras is, the spiritual disease, whatever. I'm going to start that on Sunday, uh, Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, I have a Q&A, which I do every, which I do Tuesday and Thursday, 10 o'clock in the morning, New York time, 5 o'clock Israel time, every Monday night, controversial issues on Tanakh Talk. Tuesday night, duties of the heart, speaking about the power of the evil inclination. Uh, that's 9 o'clock New York time. And Wednesday, we do Perkei Avos, Ethics of Our Fathers, still chapter 1, uh, by Mishnah 7. 
Now I have conversion class, so anyone interested in any of that, they can certainly contact me at uh, Beyond Orthodox Conversion Judaism on Facebook, or you can send me an email, rabbichaimkoffin at gmail.com, R-A-B-B-I-C-H-A-I-M-C-O-F-F-M-A-N at gmail.com. Have a great Shabbos!